Are you facing a trying time in your life? Feel like just lemons are coming your way? We've got good news. We're sharing a powerful segment this morning on how to cope when life gives you lemons. Our friends from Loma Linda are also joining us to share how to fight colon cancer with dried fruit. We have a Reflections of Hope episode and a devotional from Pastor Mark Finley. Come along with us on today's episode of Wake Up With Hope. Good morning and welcome to Wake Up With Hope. You know, we can't wait to kick off today's program. You know, honey, one of the things I just love about you is your smile. <laughs> you love to smile. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I would have to say I love your smile too. <laughs> you know, and it's a perfect day to reflect on the power of a smile because, well, it's World Smile Day. Mm, friends, have you ever thought about how important and impactful a simple smile could be? A smile can immediately break down barriers, can also brighten someone else's day. Mm, smiling also helps the smiler feel better too. So go ahead and smile today, friends. Smile and share that beautiful smile God gave you with the world around you. And if you feel like you need something to smile about, we've got your back. That's right. Our program is all about sharing the best thing to smile about, and that's Jesus. So let's begin by taking a look back at what took place on this day in history. On this day in history in 1957, the Soviet Union ushered in the space age with the launch of Sputnik, the world's first artificial satellite. Named Sputnik, meaning fellow traveler in Russian, the spacecraft was launched at 10.29 p.m. Moscow time from the Tyratum launch base in the Kazakh Republic. Sputnik measured 22 inches in diameter, weighed 184 pounds, and orbited Earth once every hour and 36 minutes. Traveling at a speed of 18,000 miles per hour, its elliptical orbit reached a maximum distance of 584 miles from Earth and came as close as 143 miles. The satellite was visible with binoculars just before sunrise or after sunset, and it transmitted radio signals strong enough to be picked up by amateur radio operators. In January 1958, as predicted, Sputnik's orbit deteriorated and the spacecraft burned up in the Earth's atmosphere. You now, the launch of Sputnik in 1957 was a bold step into the unknown. You know, our faith journey also often requires us to step out into the unknown, trusting God's plan even when we can't see the full picture. You know, as it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Like those who launched Sputnik, we are called to trust in what we cannot see, knowing that God is with us, guiding us and preparing us for greater things. You know, as we put our trust in God, our faith can open doors to new opportunities and a deeper relationship with Him. So friends, want you put your full trust in Him today? Amen. I want to do that as I walk with Jesus. Amen. Well, according to the American Cancer Society, not including skin cancers, colon cancer is the third most common cancer diagnosed in both men and women in the United States. But did you know there's a simple solution that can help? Listen in on today's episode of Live It and find out what it is. Many of you may remember being told as a child to eat your greens because they'll make you healthy and strong. Even as an adult, this idea still holds true. Eating our greens has many health benefits. In fact, pairing it up with dried fruit, legumes, and brown rice may help prevent colon polyps, 
which are abnormal growths in the colon that sometimes lead to colon cancer. Colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. Loma Linda University Health researchers found eating legumes at least three times a week reduced the risk of colon polyps by 33%. And having brown rice at least once a week reduced the risk by 40%. Eating those cooked green veggies once a day or more was associated with a reduced risk of 24%. And eating dried fruit three times a week or more reduced the risk by 26%. Mm. Legumes, dried fruits, brown rice, they have high fiber. For cooked green vegetables, we found that they have high anti-carginosin compounds that will help to decrease this risk. Taking precaution now against colon cancer is important, and you can start by eating more whole foods containing fiber. You can cook brown rice and pair it up with lentils. You can also swap white rice for brown rice. There is your tip for the day on how you can live healthier longer. When we return, we'll talk about the ultimate warrior. What's that all about? Stay with us and find out, and later, Mark Finley will share today's devotional thought. And don't forget, if you're enjoying today's show, share with a friend, or visit our website at hopetv.org slash wake up to see more. Plus, search for us on YouTube, Wake Up With Hope, to subscribe to our channel and keep up with us. We'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back. It's a fabulous Friday morning on Wake Up With Hope. You know, we're enjoying spending time with you. Deep on the plains of the African savanna are some of the bravest warriors on earth. Pastor Taj Paklov takes us on a video journey as he introduces us to the Kenyan Maasai warriors and reveals a profound lesson. Deep on the plains of this African savanna, you find some of the most remarkable people in the world. The Maasai people of Kenya and Tanzania live in one of the harshest environments on the earth. There are so many things that can kill you out here. Wild weather, poisonous insects, ferocious beasts, just to name a few. These nomadic people live on the plains where lions and cheetahs, leopards and buffaloes and elephants roam freely. They are shepherds and warriors ever on the lookout to protect their families and their flocks. The Maasai warriors are some of the bravest people on earth. Many of them armed with only swords and spears have slayed lions and hyenas in order to protect their families and their flocks from attack. These shepherd warriors never leave home without their shuka and their sword and spear. These are the weapons they use against the lions that may come their way. If a lion approaches, the Maasai warrior will take his shuka and wrap it around his left hand. As the lion leaps, the warrior gives his hand to the lion's mouth, for a bitten hand is better than a bitten head. But the shuka neutralizes the bite, and as the lion is occupied with the warrior's left hand, he is then taken down with the Maasai sword or spear in the right hand. As they face the lion, the Maasai warrior shows no fear. This is what makes them some of the bravest warriors in the world. I found it very interesting that the shuka colors are normally red with trimmings of blue, sometimes purple. In the Bible, a covering is a symbol of righteousness. Red, which is the color of blood, represents mercy and sacrifice. Blue, the color of the law, represents justice and righteousness. And then when you blend red and blue together, you get the royal color of purple. So every day that the Messiah warrior faces the dangers on the morrow, they are covered with the mercy, sacrifice, righteousness, and justice of the Lord. These are the attributes that make them a part of the royal family of heaven. The red, blue, and purple shuka can easily be seen from miles away across the brown backdrop of the African savanna. Over the centuries, it seems that the lions have been imprinted with an innate fear whenever they see the bright shuka of the Maasai warrior. The Maasai shuka also serves as a source of warmth by night, shade by day, and a place to sit and rest in their journey. This special covering is the peculiar mark of the Maasai also serving as their passport when traveling between Kenya and Tanzania.
as I spent time with these amazing people and learned of the importance of this beautiful African covering, it shouted to me of the beautiful plan of salvation. For just like the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God, came to this world as a shepherd. He came to rescue his flock from the ravenous lion that is seeking to devour us with deception. He came to lead us beside green pastures of grace and the still waters of love. But he also came as a warrior, covered in a shook of mercy and justice. He came with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, to slay the satanic lion. With an it is written, he conquered the tempter's bite. He is the great warrior shepherd that shows us how to fight the battles of the Lord. But then, at Calvary's cross, he was stripped of his shuka, and he received the mortal wound from the lion's bite. He was stripped of his shuka, that we might be clothed in the righteous covering of God. This is our passport to heaven, for through his death, we have the guarantee of life evermore. For soon and very soon, this warrior king will return in the clouds of heaven, clothed in a shuka dipped in blood, with eyes of fire, a crown on his head, a sword in his mouth. He's coming to slay the lion once and for all. And just as a shepherd gathers his flock, the heavenly warrior shepherd will gather his people and bring them to the evergreen pastures above. My friend, you may not be a Maasai warrior, but God calls you to be a spiritual warrior for him. Remember that the weapons of this spiritual warfare are not carnal, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. God's kingdom is not of this world. In this spiritual battle, we must fight the good fight of faith with the sword of truth and the shuka of righteousness. And as we do, God promises that we shall tread down the lion and the serpent under our feet. Satan's bite will have no power over us. For Jesus, who is the ultimate warrior, will lead us to final victory at last. We cannot lose when Jesus we choose. So choose him as your warrior shepherd and allow him to cover you with his righteous shuka today. Do you feel like life keeps throwing you lemons? This next segment is for you. The Incredible Journey joins us now to share how to cope when life gives you lemons. When the coronavirus pandemic began to escalate across the globe in early March, thousands of people rushed blindly to their local supermarkets. In a frenzy that's rarely been witnessed, they began clearing the shelves of dozens of essential items. While the situation seemed amusing to some, it highlighted a serious social pandemic that lay beneath the rapidly spreading viral one. People were overwhelmed with fear. So has fear really become the new norm? Well, there are definitely a handful of emotions that have slowly become the new norm. Isolation, loneliness, uncertainty, and yes, added into that mix is fear. More often than not, we fear what we don't know and can't understand. When Henry Tudor invaded England and faced off against Richard III in the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485, he brought an army of mercenaries with him. Not long after, he was crowned Henry VII, and then the dreaded sweating sickness began. It was such a deadly virus that the saying known throughout England was that a man could be merry at breakfast and dead by lunch. No one understood it, much less had a cure for it, and thousands of Englishmen died. But the fear it created was palpable. Anyone who so much as coughed, sneezed, or seemed to be sweating a little more than usual was immediately ostracized. A chambermaid working in the royal court could be immediately dismissed if she was even slightly ill. It was a terrifying time, much like the times we are living in are terrifying and fraught with so much insecurity. So what is the answer? Should we give in to fear? Jump back in terror 
when someone coughs a metre from us? Well, there's a fine line between being sensible and being panic-stricken. During a time like this, it's essential that we are sensible and that we take the necessary precautions to mitigate the risk of infection for ourselves and our families. But sensibility does not need to be accompanied by a big slice of panic. The Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 91 and verses 1 and 2, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. God is a refuge and fortress to all those who put their trust in Him. He's able to keep us safe even in the midst of the worst storms. We can turn to Him for wisdom, comfort and guidance. But above all, we can turn to Him for peace. Fear does not need to be our new norm. Instead, peace and certainty can be our new norm in Jesus. In John chapter 14 and verse 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And again in John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. When we turn on the news, it can seem like the world is descending into chaos with every passing minute. But this does not have to be our personal experience. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. We have the opportunity to trust in Jesus, to make him our refuge and our protection, and to accept his peace. It's almost time for today's devotional thought with Pastor Mark Finley. It's coming up right after this short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Wake Up With Hope. Thank you for staying with us. It's now time for our devotional thought with Pastor Mark Finley. One of the big challenges in the Christian life is to work through certain questions that seem to us to be in conflict with the principles of the Bible. Now, let me share a couple with you. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? Why is there so much suffering? That's one of the questions that I'm asked often as I travel the world in evangelism. But here's another one, and it's this second one I want to focus on today. Why does God allow wicked leaders to rule and at times kill millions of people who are innocent? Why are there so many wicked despots in the world? Why are there so many wicked autocratic leaders in the world? Now, Proverbs kind of slaps us in the face. Proverbs kind of shocks us with what it says, and so we need to unpack it. Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. What's this talking about? What it's saying is this. God is sovereign. And in spite of what is happening on earth, the sovereign God is still in control. Now, let me give you some examples of this. Take Joseph's experience. He's betrayed by his brothers. He's thrown into a pit. He goes into the palace to be a servant. He is wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife and ends up in prison. So how do you explain God then? But ultimately, Joseph interprets the dreams of the baker and the butler. Joseph ends up in Pharaoh's court, and Joseph interprets the dream of seven years of plenty, and then followed by seven years of famine. 
although Joseph was in a pit, was God still in control then? When Joseph was in the palace and in prison, was God still in control then? Did God see the end from the beginning? And did God plan to put Joseph where he was to save the nation of Israel or Jacob's sons and, and the Israelites at that time? He did. God had a plan to save his people long before Joseph knew about the plan. Take Moses' experience. When Moses, when a decree went forth that these Jewish babies be killed and Moses is in a little basket, take Moses' experience. Uh, he's brought up in the courts of Egypt. He flees into the wilderness after he kills a uh, Egyptian. You know, he, he flees. He's there for 40 years. And, and you could almost hear Moses saying, it's just a waste of my life. I've been educated in the highest education in the courts of Egypt. Moses was a historian. Moses was, he knew geography, he knew war, but yet he's out there herding sheep. But was God still sovereign? And was God gonna use that to have Moses lead his people out of the nation of Israel, uh, the nation of Egypt? He was. And you take Daniel, you know, a young man, he's captive, 17 years old. He has an experience uh, in Babylon. And what happens then? He takes three years in the University of Babylon, purposes in his heart to serve God. And God uses that to put him next to Nebuchadnezzar and ultimately Nebuchadnezzar is converted. You see, in spite of despotic rulers, in spite of autocratic rulers, God's still in control. And God opens the hearts of these rulers and these political leaders through the influence of his people. Now, sometimes that influence is through personal contact. Other times that influence is, is through prayer, where, God, where God's people pray. And as God's people pray, the circumstances change. You think of the Battle of Dunkirk in the Second World War, where Hitler's panzer divisions of tanks had driven the Allied forces right to the English Channel. But all up and down in country churches and city churches, in the evenings, the lights were on or they were, the churches were darkened. Uh, and, but people were praying, it's the point. People were praying and as they prayed, uh, Hitler made decisions to, to slow his attack down. And you had the great invasion of Dunkirk when, uh, the Allied forces evacuated their troops to save an army of tens of thousands. You see, the, the hand of the Pharaoh, the, the heart of the Pharaoh is in the, in the hand of the Lord, and he turns wherever he wishes. Now, sometimes these rulers sense divine influence, but sometimes they have absolutely no knowledge at all. The key fact is this, God is sovereign. Let me share with you an amazing experience from here in the United States. In the United States, there was a, a war called the Civil War. Now, no war is civil, a war between the North and the South. The first battle of that war was the Battle of Manassas in July 21, 1861. General McDowell led the Northern forces, the Federal forces, about 32,000. General Beauregard led the Confederate forces that that, that day swelled to about 22,000. The battle raged all day. Northern forces were attacking. Southern forces were attacking. And uh, immediately, though, as those forces approached one another, and we don't know why this happened in the history books, but from divine history, we know why it happened. History books have a hard time explaining it. The battle has raged all day. As the North and South approach one another, something unusual happens. There's confusion. Confusion in the ranks. The Northern forces retreat and they're gone. Two weeks after the battle, Ellen White, whom Seventh-day Adventists told to have prophetic guidance from God, has a vision. And in that vision, she sees an angel come down and confuse the soldiers so that the northern soldiers will retreat. And she says, this is why. See, often people say, where's God in the midst of battle? Where's God in the midst of struggle? She says, there are two reasons why that happened. Number one, these 
federal forces were young recruits. Abraham Lincoln had people come from the farms, from the factories. They were young men, 17, 18, 19, some as young as 16. And they signed up for 90 days because they thought the war was going to be over quickly. 90 days. Had they won the Battle of Manassas and marched further south down to the capital at Richmond, thousands more would have died. So what did God do? He intervened by sending the angel. Secondly, there were many pro-slavery people in the North, not only in the South. And God allowed the North to lose that battle, to punish the North for their pro-slavery position until the North would take a position against the heinous, terrible crime of slavery. But what does all of this show? What is the story of Daniel and Joseph and Moses show? What is the story that I just told you show? And how does that illustrate the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord? That in the midst of human conflict, in the midst of human strife, in the midst of war and dust and turmoil, God is still sovereign. We can walk out today with hope because God is in control of this world. Amen, Pastor Mark. And thank you, friends, for watching Wake Up With Hope. If you'd like to learn more about our program, re-watch a segment during the weekend, or share us with a friend, visit us at hopetv.org slash wake up. We are so looking forward to starting the week with you, so don't forget to join us on Monday, same time, same place. We'll have an inspiring message from Gene Boonstra from Voice of Prophecy and so much more. Also, if you enjoyed today's devotional thought and would like to learn more, visit hope.study to receive your free Bible study guides. Again, that's hope.study. Get started on your journey to a life of abundant peace. Well, we can't leave without sharing a Bible promise. And today's Bible promise comes from John chapter 14, verse 8. It says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I love that. It's such mm -hmm. a simple yet powerful promise. Are you weary? Do you feel lonely? Are you in despair, discouraged, afflicted, hopeless? Well, whatever it is, at whatever moment, Jesus has promised. He will not leave you as an orphan. He will come to you. So friends, call on him. Trust him with your life today. And now we're ready for the weekend, and we truly hope you have a fantastic weekend, friends, remembering the one who has promised to be by your side. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven today, Lord, there is uh, in a special way, there is uh, an encouraging sense of comfort to look up to, towards you and call you our Father because you have promised that you will never leave us, never forsake us. You love us with an everlasting love. And we know that we can trust in you and always rely on you as our Heavenly Father. And we pray that today, Lord, you would walk with us, guide our steps as we're filled with hope. And we're, we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.